And one thing that I want to say before uh, we start is that this is, um, so let me put it this way. This is an academic perspective on visual analytics, right? This, you're, you have, uh, in this course, we have Constantin who is responsible for the more practical parts of the lectures. So the, the, let's say the practical lectures. So you have hopefully a good practical uh, uh, overview of this stuff related to visual analytics by watching his lectures or by following his lectures. So what I am offering is a more academic view on visual analytics, okay? So this is visual analytics as described in maybe the most important book in the area where visual analytics was described and detailed uh, about, let's say, 10 years ago. So it's a, it's kind of, it's, it's a textbook, right? And I just want to make sure that you guys understand that uh, what, this is what this is what I'm going to offer you today. So for the practical stuff, it's it's more uh, related to Constantine's lectures. Okay. So let's go for uh, an introduction about visual analytics. This is the just the general introduction about you know the needs for visual analytics. The awareness of the problem of how to understand and analyze our data has greatly increased. We know that we have too much too much data. We have uh, to complex data, and there are there's always a need for whatever techniques we can use in order to understand that and to make decisions, for example. And although machine learning is probably one of the most common ones nowadays, uh, we know it's a buzzword, everyone is doing that, fully automated search, uh, filter and analysis only work reliably for well-defined and well-understood problems. What does that mean? When you're running a machine learning algorithm, we've talked about it before, I'm just kind of like doing a quick recap. When, we're, when we work with uh, machine learning problems, usually we have a very well-defined problem, right? We know exactly what we're gonna do. We wanna train our algorithm to minimize this specific function, this cost function, and know exactly what it means. So there was a, so the important part here is that usually with machine learning, before you get to the, to the step where you're actually applying it, there was a previous step where you had to understand the problem and then model it, or not model in terms of a machine learning model, but model it in your mind, let's say, as some kind of objective problem. And then you, you, cho you choose whatever machine learning algorithm you wanna use, and then you apply it, and you get some substitution for that. But the most important part here is that whenever you do this kind of fully automated thing, you have already taken a step before that to understand the problem. So the, what, what, what is being represented in your fully automated data processing methods is your knowledge about the problem. That is what, that is what the fully automated method represents. It represents, it's, it's an implementation, it's a concretization of this, this knowledge that you already have about this, this problem, this challenge, or whatever it is that you're doing. But this is not always transparent, right? So it's not always easy to understand, first of all, what led us to actually choose that specific thing among so many others that are available. But also, when you do it, the, the, this, this method itself, this concrete thing itself that you did in order to concretize what you're, we're thinking, may also be wrong in many different ways. And that's not clear also, right? So it's important that the process itself has to be transparent in a way that you can understand what it means and you can also ask, assess it if you need because maybe something is wrong, right? So these are, these are very, very, let's say, up-to-date problems in machine learning, as people nowadays call them, explainable machine learning or interpretable machine learning, because people are starting to get like, frustrated with so much complicated machine learning going on around everyone, and, and very few people actually understand what, why they, they do what they do. And visual analytics is, is not that. 
So Fisher Analytics, in Fisher Analytics, actually, this, this previous step that, that you had of understanding the problem, it's integrated into the, the discipline of Fisher Analytics. So you're not supposed to, when, when you start, let's say, when you start using a certain system or a certain method, a visual analytics system or a visual analytics method or something like that, you're not supposed to have a perfect understanding of the problem at hand. Because the visual analytics itself has the goal to lead you through this process. So I'm not saying that every visual analytics program is completely open and we'll have like this perfect you know uh, support for for you to understand your data from every possible direction no what i'm saying is that when you design a visual analytics system you have to keep in mind that whatever it is that your visual analytics system is supposed to solve whatever problem is supposed to solve it must be open enough so that when the user gets in touch with the system the user is also bringing something in. It's not just like a passive, in a way, a situation where you use the system, the system gives you all the answers. It's quite the opposite. It's a complete and iterative loop between the user influencing the system and the system giving some kind of a feedback to the user and the user, again, influencing the system and so on. So that's, that's the core. Of visual analytics, so that whatever it is that you do with visual analytics, it has to be an interaction between the human and the machine. The media through which this interaction occurs is visualization. Visualization is the the interface between the human and the machine. Right. We're gonna talk about this in more details, but just in general. So it's important also to remember that visual analytics is not as, as mature as information visualization. Okay, so information visualization is being researched for decades and decades and decades. I mean, you can go all the way back to God knows when. Uh, uh, at some point, uh, in, in some level or other, there were people uh, discussing information visualization. Of course, let's say, 30 or 40 years, well, let's put it 30 years when, when we really had, when we really started to have to have more, more decent, more stronger, let's say, um, computer graphics, hardware and infrastructure. That's when the modern formation visualization really kicked off. But still, I'm talking about 30, 30 years or a little bit more than 30 years, that's, that's much more than what we have with visual analytics, okay? Visual analytics, uh, the first time anyone talked about visual analytics at all was 2004. And that was just this two guys who just published the paper. Although, okay, you can still think, well, the concepts about visual analytics were, were already being discussed for a while. Yeah, but as a, as a discipline, as a body of work, it exists for roughly 10 to 15 years. So that's not uh, a lot of time. So the, so the definitions are not written in stone, so to speak. It's not something that that's it and period. The two most important ones or the most common ones are the science of analytical reasoning facilitated by interactive human machine interfaces that comes from the original paper in 2004. So what does that mean? The science of an analytical reason facilitated by interactive human machine interfaces. It doesn't even talk about visualization, which is interesting, right? It's just, it's, it's just saying that, look, there's some kind of a process of reasoning and it's interactive between the human and the machine. Uh, and and this, so, so visual analytics is the science of understanding how this interchange works. Then we have the definition from Kaim, 2010. This is the book that I have used mostly as the basis for this lecture. The book is actually free, available on the internet. I should have a link somewhere. 
uh, I, you know what? I'm going to put the link on the Moodle page because it's free. It's a PDF. You can download it. And it's actually a pretty good book. I mean, it's 2010, so it's not super up to date. But the, the basics are there. Okay? And, and it's also the basis for this uh, set of slides, mostly, with some adjustments. Uh, probably the most important visual analytics textbook nowadays. And it's a very good book. And in this case, they go a little bit, uh, they're a little bit more concrete about it. So they say that visual analytics combines automated analysis techniques with interactive visualizations for an effective understanding, reasoning, and decision making on the basis of very large and complex data sets. So let's dissecate this very quickly. Vision analytics combines automated analysis techniques. So it's not saying that the automated analysis techniques are not there at all. They are. They're still there. So I'm not saying that, for example, uh, machine learning or data mining is not there. It's still there. But it's combined with interactive visualizations. And again, interactive visualizations, not only visualizations, period. Like, for example, what the, this, this very quick exploratory data analysis that I did in the beginning of the lecture with um, this IMDB uh, data, that was just a static visualization. Thing. It was just an exploratory data analysis made with static visualizations. And that's perfectly fine up to a certain point, right? But that's not what visual analytics is about. Visual analytics is about interactive visualizations. And the goal of this is to effectively understand reason and, and make decisions on the basis of very, very large and complex data sets. Very large and complex data sets. Of course, in the course itself, we don't really go that far. I mean, most of you will not go that far into very large and complex data sets. Because that will also mean that you would need to start thinking about all the, all the, the kinds of stuff like parallel computing and things like that. But we're, we're not going to go that way. But this is a much more concrete and I think much more interesting definition than the previous one, although the previous one was uh, more general, so more abstract, which is also good sometimes, depending on what you want to do. In more details, the goals of visual analytics, to turn information overload into an opportunity. We kind of assume that we are going through an information overload nowadays, right? I guess everyone is more or less agrees on that. But there's simply too much information, too, too, much, too many things to consider at the same time, all the time, everywhere, about everything. And, and the idea here is that not to, to, to let this go to waste and make it into an opportunity. Making data and information processing transparent for an analytic discourse. I like, I like the word ana, or the sentence um, analytic discourse here or the concept concept of analytic discourse so it's when you say analytic discourse you're saying whatever decisions that come out of your visual analytics system are not supposed to be final they are one part of a discourse so you bring that to the table someone else may bring something else to the table that's what happens when you analyze large and complex data. It's never as easy as saying this is true and that is false. Uh, it's part of the discourse. So making this data and this information processing transparent adds to this idea of bringing it to the discourse in, so that it can be verified. It can be uh, you know, challenged also. Foster the constructive evaluation, correction, and rapid improvement of our processes and models. Visualizations of these processes will provide the means of examining the actual processes instead of just the results. That is very important in visual analytics. It's not always there. It's not always present, but it's for sure one of the strongest pillars of visual analytics, which is the idea that we should bring, the, bring up the means not only to just uh, investigate the results of a certain data processing uh, method, but also the, the process itself. How, how did the process itself came to be? Are we uh, satisfied with this? Are there some, some parts of this process that I, as a user, could interfere with? 
and ultimately the improvement of our knowledge and our decisions. And um, well, this is a very abstract general goal, but I guess that's also valid. So on a grand scale, vision analytics provides technology that combines the strengths of human and electronic data processing. Again, like we said, like I said before, vision analytics, the core of vision analytics is this interaction between the human and the computer through visualization. That's why we call it visual analytics. Because I mean, you could do statistical analysis by interfacing with the data using a command line interface, for example, right? You could like using R uh, or even Python on, on a terminal, you can give many, many different commands in order to clean some data set, uh, pre-process it, run some analysis, check the results and so on. But the idea of visual analytics is, is that you do this through a visual interface, through a medium that actually brings you this, this the feedback of this process visually. So visualization becomes this medium of the semi-automated analytical process. The humans and the machines, they cooperate because we, we have different distinct uh, capabilities, right? There are things that a machine can do better than us nowadays. If, if it's a very boring process, it's, if it's a very repetitive process, and if we need that to be done in very, very fast, like, I don't know, a clustering algorithm, uh, you define an algorithm, then you run it, and then it gives you clusters. So obviously, a computer can do that much better than we could, especially in high dimensions. Uh, but the user has to be the ultimate authority here in directing the analysis, right? We must remember that the, whatever the computer does is not the final answer. It's just one part of the analytical discourse. And you even, you, you know, when you talk to the computer to say, hey, this is not okay, actually, I need to change this uh, and get a, get, get a new result. And, and basically the system, the visual analytics system, in order to foster this communication must give them the effective means of interaction to focus on, so that the user can focus on their specific task. That's very important um, because the, here we're talking not only of visualization, but also interaction. So that's even, let's say, a research area in itself, how to interact, right? And this is the book um, that we are discussing. It's called uh, Mastering the Information Age, Solving Problems with Visual Analytics. And it's edited by this guy, Daniel Kahn, which is probably one of the top three visualization people in the world. And, and every chapter here is actually written by a group of very important researchers in their specific area. So that's why it's a very interesting book to, to read. It's very academic. I, like I said, it's not, a, it's not like a practical treatment on the, on the subject. It's more, a, it's more of an academic or, or academic uh, perspective on the subject, which is part of what you, know, we, you have to go through, considering that, of course, you, you guys are master and PhD students, not undergrads. So, so that's part of your, uh, let's say, journey. To, to have the academic view of perspective on things. And visual analytics is, is highly interdisciplinary, combining various related research areas. Uh, these all, a little bit of each of these is actually contained in this book in, in each chapter, written by very important people, researchers from each of the areas. So visualization, obviously, I, as I said, is the medium between the human and the, the machine. Data mining, and, and as you can see here, I have, I have uh, differentiated between data mining and machine learning because data mining is, well, you guys are, most of you are in the data mining course, so, you, so you've, you've been slowly seeing how, how it, they differ because it's usually data mining is unsupervised, is about extracting uh, structures and patterns from the data itself without uh, without a specific goal of like optimizing external labels or something like that. And so you can see that there is an overlap, but it's not the same, right? So, so with, with visual analytics, usually in, in visual analytics in general, data mining is a little bit of a better fit than actual machine learning. Uh, there is a lot of visual analytics with machine learning, but usually it's about understanding the machine learning 
the system. Because usually machine learning pro, uh, models or processes or algorithms, they are very complicated. So if you don't trust that they will simply give you the best answer, period, you may build visual analytic systems in order to explore this machine learning uh, algorithm and make sure that you can influence it and that it, it is giving you the right answer. But with data mining, usually data mining itself is, is in this process. Because since data mining is much more open than machine learning in terms of the actual goals of the mining process, then it works as a very, uh, data mining and visualization together work very nicely in this, in this loop of man interacting with machine. Okay. Then statistics, always, there's always a little bit of statistics everywhere, uh, everywhere where there is data analysis whether it's by uh, you know, testing hypothesis that you got through the, the visualization, or if it's just uh, obtaining some kind of uh, statistical summary of the data, subsets of the data, so on and so forth. So there's always a little bit of statistics. They're fine, it's the foundation of data analysis. Uh, Human-computer interaction, like I said, it's, uh, again, Interactivity itself is a hugely complicated science, and not only with visualization, but just interaction in general. But of course, there are some specific also problems with how to interact with visualization. Right? Cognition science, how is it that people actually make decisions? How is it that people think about complicated problems? What are the thinking or the cognition methods that we use in our brain in order to f look for the solution of a complicated problem. All these things are also important when you're doing visual analytics. I mean, of course, you're not supposed to know everything, but, uh, but you're, you, can, you can have, a, a, let's say, an overall perspective of the things that are involved so that you, know, you are a better visual analytics engineer. We're not going to talk about all these, though, uh, today because it's uh, out of the scope. I mean, I cannot talk about all of these in one lecture. It makes no sense. There, a quick history about visual analytics is that it started. So at first, the statistics or data mining. It's it's hard in the beginning. It's hard to differentiate between the two because they're just data mining was just one way to to do, to talk about statistics, uh, especially when when it was about statistics with very large data sets. That was like where, it, where the, this term data mining kind of came from. It was just statistics. Uh, maybe statistics together with computers. And visualization and interaction, they were developed independently, right? So as two completely separate fields. So in the beginning, people didn't really um, think too much about how these two things could be put together. Right, uh, there was not really like a motivation for doing that. So they developed independently as two completely separate fields. You, some people do data mining in computers or even by hand. Other people are look are talk are discussing visualization, how to visualize things, and how to interact with that. But they didn't really go together. And then visualization was mostly used as confirmatory data analysis to present results that were obtained automatically. So you. You can do something with a data mining uh, algorithm, then that gives you some results, and then you can use visualization, like very simple visualization, just to show that, that the, statically, period. But then this guy called John Tukey gave, came, uh, and around the 60s and the 70s, more strongly in the 70s, he came up with this idea of exploratory data analysis. And he started to advocate for this, for this process of sense making by using interactive visualization. So you want, he wanted people to stop being so rigid with the statistics, because if you if you study a little bit of statistics, hypothesis testing, and so on and so forth, you will see you will find it's very common uh, to find critic critics about this, people that will criticize how much um, how much strength or how much confidence we we give to very rigid uh, hypothesis testing, for example. 
So if you study a little bit of statistics, you will see that there are, there are ways to, there are many problems with hypothesis testing as it is, uh, especially when you take it as a final answer for everything. So you tested it, your p-value is less than uh, 0.01, uh, that's it. You're, you, you consider that as obviously you have found a solution to some kind of a problem, period, by running a single experiment. <laughs> And uh, there's a lot of people who criticize that very strongly and who advocate for this process of sense making. You can do sense making without interactive visualization, but John Tukey was more like, I want to, I think we should do this with interactive visualization. And I think that whoever is dealing with data, especially with large data, should, should do this using interactive visualization without specific preconceived notions about it. And, and it was really revolutionary. He has a book called Exploratory Data Analysis from the 70s, if I'm not mistaken, or uh, if not 70s, from the 80s, but I think it's 70, like 77, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, which is a great book. It's still completely uh, relevant nowadays. If you want to look for it, it's, I mean, of course, it's from 1977. So, but conceptually speaking, it's still very relevant and very interesting. Uh, ah, and he, this is him, <laughs> showing his, his uh, Prim9 system in 1972. This was a system that they built in the 70s for visualizing data, which is uh, amazing. And actually, if we have a little bit of time, I guess we do, I will show you a video. Uh, then I guess I have to change the share to... Google Chrome, yeah. Can you see, can you guys see the video on YouTube? Yes. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll play, let's play. So, I, didn't, I don't know if you're getting the audio. Yeah, but basically that's, that's yeah. That's his system in 1972. So it's uh, almost like, uh, Almost like, like the scatterplot systems that we use nowadays everywhere. And, and it's even 3D, which is something that nowadays, for some reason, people don't like to use anymore. I'm, I'm partial to that. I, I kind of like it. But um, it is true that in, in academia, 3D scatterplots are, are not seen with good eyes. I don't know if you're getting the audio, but do you, do you hear something from him? No, no. No, no. Oh, really. uh, you don't hear him. Okay. So what he's saying is that rotation by itself is already useful. You can uh, check the video later. But it's augmented by the other features of the system. So he's saying that uh, it's very important to look at the data from different perspectives at the same time, which is super like up to date still. And, and now he is going through like different, oh, you see, he went through different perspectives of the data to look, to show that if you can, uh, if you cycle through uh, different 2D projections of the same data set, then you end up finding new new patterns as you go. So, so you, you can see how this is a very, very extremely uh, exploratory process that is more basically simply just exploratory. So now it's showing that you can rotate things. It's a, yeah, now I was showing that he has combined some different uh, variables into one axis, but not, and, and it's rotating against the other. Anyway, let me go back to the slides. Yeah, anyway, this is, the, the vi visual analytics in a way, very, 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 in its very, very, very beginning, was more or less around that time, even though, he, um, they didn't have like super modern interaction or super modern uh, data analysis algorithms. 
he was he was advocating for this process, this ex exploratory process of just just grow through this thing without knowing what to expect, and then let's see what happens. Yeah, and, and for a while, the idea of mixing statistics with data mining uh, and data mining with information visualization came to be known as visual data mining. It's hard to say exactly when or why visual data mining became visual analytics and what is exactly the difference. I think I, I like to think only that visual data mining was basically just a prototype of visual analytics. Um, but for, for some, and you can see even, it's interesting that this book said, the, the, author, the title of this book is Visual Data Mining, Theory, Techniques, and Tools for Visual Analytics. So it, they, they mix both at the same time. I mean, who knows? Uh, for a while, people were talking a lot about visual data mining when it came to using visual interfaces to, to steer or to, to, to use data mining uh, interactively and visually. But then at some point it became visual analytics. And, and then this kind of kick-started more, let's say, the actual research area of visual analytics. Right? There are some uh, examples of some early visual analytics. Systems. Actually, this one's not early, but this one's very, I, I think, early visual analytics system for um, exploring software dependencies between classes. Now, the VA process, so the visual analytics process. We gave a lot of, we, I talked a lot about the motivation and the stuff that uh, are, let's say, behind the visual analytics movement. But what is exactly visual analytics when it comes to the process of, of the developing and of, um, let's say, fomenting it, a, this, this visual analytics process of gathering knowledge through interactive visualization and data analysis? Well, visual analytics tools and techniques should enable people to synthesize information and derive insights from massive, dynamic, ambiguous, and often conflicting data. It's, it's very interesting to see here how, hope, how open this is, massive, dynamic, ambiguous, and often conflicting. So basically any kind of data. Each of these things can be treated in a different way, and visual analytics systems may touch on some of them at the same time, depending on the needs of the domain. Detect the expected and discover the unexpected. This is a very interesting one um, because it kind of it kind of gives a nice little framework. I think I think Andres probably have talked to you about this before. Actually, I did also mention this in the introduction uh, slides. But detect the expected. What does that mean? As a recap, it means well, you know, if there's something I expect to see in my data then I should be seeing that. Because if I'm not, then maybe my visualization is not correct, right? I mean, I probably have some kind of understanding of what the data is in some, in a, in a, even if I'm in a higher, very, very high level. And when you have that and you generate a visualization and you don't see that, that's a problem. But then after you detect the expected, you want to discover the unexpected. And this is usually, where we, uh, let's say, where visual analytics tools shine the most, right? Finding out something new in the data that you have at hand is really like, it's a, it's a very interesting process of gathering knowledge. And it's really, this is like, if your visual analytics tool manages to do this, even if, even if in some small scale, that's usually pretty cool. All right. Provide timely, defensible, and understandable assessments. Um, so you see, this here is one very interesting difference also between, let's say, visual analytics and machine learning in general. Uh, when you have a very, very, very complicated ne neural network, for example, and let's say you've very carefully um, set the parameters of the neural network so that it gives you the best possible results, it becomes, but th then depending on how many layers, you, especially if, you, if it's a deep in, a neural network, depending on how many layers it has and how complex these layers are, 
it's hard to say that you can argue for the results that you get from the neural network, right? Most of the time. So visual analytics is more like, this is for the human being to make a decision, right? So we, so it must be clear how this thing actually came to be. Like, what is this? What is this, this decision? What is this results that we, that, that I'm giving, let's say the visual analytics system is given to the user. How, how did we get here? So the, ideally you got, you go from a very high level understanding of your, of your data when you, when you first get in touch with your visual analytics system. And then together with the system, you're building this knowledge until you get to the end of the end results. If that happens, then not only the system has given you some kind of an insight, but you have built the path to that insight. So you know why that insight is true. So you know that you've selected a certain subset of the data and then you went and you zoomed in there and then you select three different features and then you combine them in a certain way and that gave you the final visualization that allowed you to understand a phenomenon that was happening in your data. So if you have to explain this to someone, you will say, well, you know, if you look at this subset and you filter the, the dimensions in such a way, then you will see this thing and this thing is what we're looking for. So it's timely, it's defensible, and it's understandable because you arrived at it yourself. And that is, of, of course, not always happening, but it's an ideal, let's say, an ideal process, right? And communicate these assessments effectively for action. Now, this, this is the idea of having effective visualizations, right? Uh, if the visualization is driving the process, all the process, then this visualization should be effective. So that's when, that's when the actual foundational visualization, let's say, especially the stuff that you're studying in 4D 805, and this is where this, this foundational visualization actually makes the difference. Because that's where you use all these concepts of how to build good visualizations. Now I'm gonna go through a couple of examples of applications. Uh, just like very, very general, right? I'm not gonna go in, in so many details in, in any of them, but it's just to give you guys this kind of uh, overview of ideas and, and how they are actually applied in some examples. And these examples are also coming from the book, so they are like curated, let's say. They're not just something that you can find around the internet. This is a system called CGV, Coordinated Graph Visualization. This is visual support for the simulation of climate models. So just by, just by quickly glancing at this system, you can see, in general, five different visualizations in, in five, <laughs> in different levels of complexity. You have this kind of a heat map here, which is using some crazily bad, can you see the mouse when I move like this? Yeah, right. yeah. okay. Uh, so you have this, this heat map over here, which is, I don't know exactly what it's showing, but maybe a region of the world with, with temperature, I'm not sure. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different variables here being visualized with parallel coordinates. And I guess you guys remember parallel coordinates either from my lecture or from Andreas. I don't know if you've seen this with Andreas, but, but we talked about parallel coordinates before, right? It's this, this idea that you take the axis of the data and then you put them all in parallel and then you, for each data point, you connect, uh, you connect this, this polyline through the axis, so, and then this happens. And there is this, of course, this world map, and, and this world map is overlaid with uh, kind of like a, a network on top of it, apparently, 
unfortunately, I, can, I cannot tell you exactly what this network is, but it's, uh, I guess, it's obviously something related to the simulation, the simulation of climate. And, and I guess the same thing that you see here can be seen also on this side, but on a projection of the world, right? It's apparently the same thing because I see these big circles over here, spheres, and then I see the same thing over here. I'm not sure if this is an also a projection, maybe not. Anyway, and then there's some uh, some stuff down here also degrees, degree in between us. This is these are network measures actually. And, and I guess this probably shows the measures of whatever is selected because there is a selection going on here. So you can see that there's some point selected over here. The same point is probably uh, also highlighted over here in the parallel coordinates. So you see this, this red thing here, which is probably represents the same point as here. And, and you see the, the dimensions here, like size, weight, degree, local degree, longitude, latitude, between us. So it's, these are probably all um, dimensions of the point that we see here. Then we see the points. And look at how interesting this is, because you're looking at the same thing so, from so many different, um, from so many different perspectives at the same time. You see, all many dimensions, you see it as a natural network. So I, I'm guessing this is a multivariate network. So it's a network with uh, attributes on top of the nodes, I guess. And you're, you're looking at it from so many different perspectives at the same time. And, and at the same time, they're connected because when you select something in one, in one view, you also see it on the other view. So this is very much like a very, uh, let's say canonical visual analytics approach. And there are also controls here, probably to filter something or to change, affect the way that the visualizations are being shown. And this, this system involves view ensemble. So a view ensemble is just this collection of views like this, which can be created dynamically. This is very interesting. There are many uh, visual analytics systems that s support this kind of thing, where you can just kind of put these views together. They're not fixed in place. You can uh, choose which views you want to see at the same time, and then you can position them somehow. There's enhanced dynamic filtering, uh, I guess, depending on, on how the simulation is going. You can filter things in a specific way. There's graph lenses, so different ways to look at the graph. A lens is usually uh, an interactive. You're going to look, you're going to see it in the interactive interaction lecture from uh, Andreas Karen, but usually a lens is some interactive uh, pointer that that changes the visualization as you move it around. So that's a, that would be like a graph lens. Edge-based navigation, I guess, so that you could follow edges from, from nodes to other nodes and so on. And all these things are grouped together in the same system at the same time. And, and you're looking at the same thing from many different perspectives. Now, just think about it. This is <clears throat> such an abstract thing to, to have. Looking at uh, the same data set from four or even five different perspectives at the same time where all these perspectives, perspectives are completely different. And most of them, at least, or at least some of them, don't even have any connection with the real world, so to speak. These, in this case, they have, but like this one doesn't have, and this one maybe, I'm not sure, but I guess maybe this is, this one is, is just another heat map that represents also a projection here, but they're so abstract. And at the same time, when you put them all together, they still fit and they can still be a cohesive thing, which is quite kind of, kind of amazing. Another example, um, this is the analysis of a distributed network attack on the SSH service of a university network using this thing called nflow-vis, the name of the tool. So there are lots of things happening here at the same time, as always with visual analytics. Uh, and as you can see, there's a, there's a tree map on the background of this picture. 
And if you remember it correctly, uh, we talked about two maps last time. That was like I think the last thing we discussed in the lecture. And it's a, a tree map is a way to map uh, a tree. <laughs> That's why I call it a tree map. Uh, but it's it's a way to map a tree in three in two dimensions, right? So so there's a hierarchy of squares or rectangles inside other rectangles inside other, other rectangles and so on. And this is what the background here represents: is the internal network structure with hosts as rectangles on the lowest level and external hosts as colored dots on the outside. So if you see these colored points on the outside, these are actually external to the university's network. We don't know where they come from. All we know is that they're external. And, and then you have these hierarchical edge bundles, which are basically just edge bundles here, this, this edges that are bundled together. Uh, they reveal communication patterns such as the distributed attack from the hosts on the upper side. So there was this attack where these many or all of these hosts on the upper side here were trying to access some some hosts inside the university at the same time. I think this is very related to you, uh, Daniel, <laughs> in a way. And so, so this is so this these. I don't know exactly what are the interactive capabilities of this um, system exactly, but you can see how the mix of these visualizations makes it uh, make it lets us kind of like see where where most of the attacks are came, coming from probably from this area over here and in general where they are being directed to so mostly like these hosts over here and some hosts over here and some other hosts on the bottom here. i mean there's a lot of stuff happening at the same time but still it's uh, it's this overlay of visualization coupled with whatever interactive capabilities are here that make the visual analytics system. This one is an interactive visual analysis of a cooling jacket simulation. This cooling jacket, I don't know exactly uh, what is a cooling jacket, but I know it's something that is related to engines. So it's something probably that helps an engine stay cool as it is functioning. And, and so you can see, in this case, it's very interesting. And the reason I, I think this example is very interesting is because in this example, you have this mix of something that looks, that comes from reality, so to speak, which is this, this 3D model of this thing that's inside the engine, coupled with two very abstract views, which are just bar charts or histograms with colors. So it's this mix of real with uh, artificial, so to speak, or with abstract, concrete with abstract. And, and they, they must necessarily work together so that you, by, by exploring both of them at the same time, by filtering one and then seeing the results of this future on the other one, so maybe you're interested in some region of the cooling jacket, so you select that region that will reflect on the bottom side where the asterisk information is being shown. On the other hand, if you choose something on the, the the lower side, maybe some of these informations are not totally correlated with one specific region of the cooling jacket. So you so you select that, and then you see that represented spread out in the in the whole uh, let's say cooling jacket because there was not one specific place where that was happening. This this interplay is amazing. That's something that you might not be able to do. If you were looking only at the 3D model, for example, you would might, maybe you'd, you wouldn't find patterns that are not intrinsically related with the actual shape, because then you, if you wanted to select something, you would have to select you know a certain part of it. But maybe some patterns of how the the temperature is is I don't know through time in this uh, model, this 3D model. You might not see it if you didn't have an, a more abstract view that was actually didn't didn't really care about the three D model, the shape of the three D model. And and this is this is very interesting to see. So the user has focused on critical regions of high temperatures and low flow velocities. So so these areas are high temperature and low flow velocity, and 
they may indicate locations of insufficient cooling, right? So locations of insufficient cooling spread all over the 3D model, which is something that you m might not see if you didn't have this, this interplay between the concrete and the abstract. So yeah, coming back to the V to, to that idea of the VA process. So okay, we have a VA process. We have some requirements, so to speak, of visual analytics tools. But how how is that achieved, right? If we look at visual analytics tools, these examples that we saw and and others that are out there, and I mean, we cannot just take them. Oh, sorry, Daniel, you want to ask a question? I, I didn't see. That. Sorry, if that, it was wrong. <laughs> Just wondering if you agree with me because those are all great uh, visualization. But with the power of and being able to put up everything, actually calls for uh, uh, Occam's razor is more and more important for effective visualizations. Uh, that's my belief because it's so easy to put up everything. So yes, what you need is on the screen, but you have actually, uh, you, it gets lost in the diversity of what you can do. So there is a, a moment or an art form that is really more and more important. And that is to actually figure out what you really need to see and then sort of take away all the other stuff. Sometimes visualization seems to be built around how much can I put there? And that's rarely the, the strategy for obtaining a, an effective one. Do you agree? I absolutely agree. Uh, I think one of the, uh, I think this, this is also touched on one of the slides that I have next, but one of the differences, I think, at least in theory, of between visual analytics and visualization is exactly that is that in visual analytics you kind of assume that you're coming from this this position where the data is too large and too complicated so so actually ideally even before you start the the exploration you need to already have some some way to filter and to not to filter but to summarize let's say the data set even before you start uh, the exploration because usually when you talk about visualization without vision analytics you're talking about zooming and filtering but zooming and filtering based on the entire thing like you said so you, you can't even you can zoom and filter but if, before you do that you you may be overwhelmed with so much stuff so the idea with visual analytics is that since you have this back and forth with the computer, uh, even before you start, you should always already have a summary. Because if you don't have that, then we kind of assume that the data itself is too complicated and too much. And, and I guess that also applies to different views. But I, I completely agree with you. I think if you, um, if you manage to make like less is more, I think that, that is certainly a very valid thing so so yeah so we have this we have this va this va i think well they have these requirements but how do you get there the idea how do you i mean if if we take these tools all individually right i mean we cannot just consider that they are all individual works of art where uh where you just start from scratch every time every time you do it right like every time you you build a vision analytics tool, you start from scratch, uh, and then then we wouldn't be able to take these tools as a group of common things with with certain things in common, certain things differently, right? So the the VA process. So so let's say this this people who who defined so to speak the area of uh, vision analytics, they came up with this um, understanding of what is one general visual analytics process. And I think this is very interesting for you guys, since you are going to, to develop some visual analytics tools, to think about this when you are developing your tools and to think, well, is this thing that I'm doing actually, does it fit with this, this very, very general model? And if it doesn't, 
then maybe it's it's uh, could be a, a reason for you to reflect and think about it before before you you move on. So we can go very quickly through this this model. Well, not very quickly, but uh, as quick as possible <laughs> through this model in order for us to understand just this general idea of what is the visual analytics process, right? And and uh, what is common in in many, if not most, of the visual analytics tools. The first step is often to pre-process and transform the data to derive different representations. Now, this is related to that, you know, when we were talking about the visualization pipeline, where we had this first step of taking raw data and then extracting some structure from that. This is what's happening in this process, this first step of the process. So you're not, you're not only pre-processing, so you're also cleaning up the data and everything, but you're also transforming it in different representations. So if, it, if we consider that we have this uh, previous system that we were looking at, the CGV, and you have this four different or five different views, then the, the thing is that these four different views, they are coming individually from one specific perspective or one spe specific structural perspective on the data. So the same data set can be transformed into different types of, of, of views or of the structures. And, and these structures, they will uh, serve as the basis for different views. So this is the first step to derive different representations for further exploration. And of course, typical pre-processing tasks include data cleaning, normalization, grouping, uh, if it makes sense, or integration of heterogeneous data sources. Heterogeneous data sources is something that's very complicated and very up, up to date nowadays. So you, you have data coming from different sources, but you, but, that, but you know that that data is connected to each other conceptually. So you know that they represent the same data points, for example, but from different uh, different sources of data, then you, you need to integrate that somehow. Uh, maybe some of them are numerical, some of them are categorical, uh, and you need to integrate them somehow. So that's all done in this step, let's say, of uh, data transformation. And then you see this small loop here of transformation, which means like data becomes still data, but transformed in general, right? Now, after transformation, then you, you have a choice between two things. Either you do some visual mapping, which is what we saw in the information visualization pipeline, right? You do some mapping into some kind of a visual structure, or you do some data mining in order to generate some model from that data. Both of them work, and as, you, as we will see, they actually work together, but let's say, at the first, the first step, you need to, to choose. So if you choose to do automated data analysis first, then data mining methods are applied to generate models. And like, for example, let's say your, your vision analytics tool uh, uses clustering to do something. So let's say that you just first run a clustering algorithm from your data, right? And that gives you some set of, some set of clusters. Now, you know, or at least you expect, that these clusters that you just generated, they're not final, right? They're not going to be, they, they, they're supposed to be refined. They're supposed to be explored and changed and updated. But at least you got something. It's, it's, it's uh, analogous to when you are running an optimization process with gradient descent and you come up with one bad initial solution or random initial solution, which will then be uh, improved, right? So in this case, it's just that in this case, it's usually not random. It's usually based on some assumption that you have, and then you generate this first initial solution, right? But like I said, you, we, we expect that once a model is created, the analyst has to evaluate and refine this model. So that must be done by interacting with the data. You see parameter refinement here. This is also something that you can do in the model. If visual data exploration is performed first, so that was this option, right? The user has to confirm the generated hypothesis by an automated analysis. So if you, if you go from the data and you, you get a visualization from that, then necessarily, if you come up with some kind of hypothesis from that, that hypothesis need to be 
let's say, confirmed with some kind of automated data analysis. Uh, it, this is a very abstract definition, but it basically means that just gathering some information from the visualization itself is not enough in a visual analytics system. It must be something that's connected to the results that will come from the actual algorithm. So they work together. User interaction is needed to review insightful information, for instance, by zooming in on different areas or by considering different views. So again, different views, like we said, like we saw before, this idea of uh, being able to select and zoom in into some areas or to filter some areas, and this is all, this should all be done through the visualization and through user interaction, which is over here. But, I mean, even though you have this choice of starting with one or, or the other, the actual process, the let's say the bulk of the process should be actually an exchange between both. So through, so through model visualization, you can evaluate the findings of the generated models. So something like a clustering, then you generated it. And then through visualization, you're going to analyze the results of that clustering to see if they make sense or not somehow. And then if they make sense, you can just say, okay, cool, um, that's it, I'm, I'm happy with the results. If they don't uh, make sense, then you will, through the visualization, you will steer this model building in the automatic analysis. That's, what, that's, that's the interesting part over here. You have the models, then let's say you run a clustering algorithm on them. Through the visualization, you look at the clustering and you say, uh, that doesn't really make sense. I think I need to change this parameter or that parameter, and then you regenerate the models. So that's that's the arrow here of model building from the visualization to the models. And then this loop keeps on going. So after you change the model, the model is regenerated, then the model visualization is done in order to see to take a look at the model, and so on and so forth. Alternating between them, leads to a continuous refinement and verification of preliminary results. Now, one thing that's very important here is to, to understand that this is not optimization, okay? So, sometimes we say, well, you, you know, we're refining the model because we want to get a better model. And I look at the model and I say, oh, this is not actually really good uh, and I want to refine it. But it's important to understand one thing. We're not only talking about improving the model, we're also talking about changing the model. So maybe you're actually testing a different hypothesis, not because you think it's bad, but simply because you can. For example, maybe you have five different clustering algorithms uh, available to you. And through the visualization, you may want to change between k-means and hierarchical clustering or uh, agglomerative clustering. And maybe, from from that one, you're still not happy, so you want to try DB scan. Or maybe you are happy, but you're interested in, in, suing, in seeing what DB scan is going to offer you, because then you can basically put them side by side and say, well, you know, I, actually, I like more the DB scan version, even though the one was the first one was even like all right. So visualization, the visual analytics process allows you to do that to explore hypotheses. I think that maybe DB scan is going to work better in this data set. So I'm gonna run it anyway, and then I will compare it uh, with the previous. So you're not only refining, but also exploring and testing different things, okay? And then in summary, uh, at the end, we expect that some knowledge will be created. So the visual analytics process should be able to generate some knowledge to you about that you didn't know about the data set in the, the first place. And, and, and there's also this, loop this feedback loop here that maybe you know a week from now with the new knowledge that you have you just go back to the system you run it again and and you end up having like using different data models uh, and you start the process all over again because you you've learned something new so that that could be used as fuel to the next let's say iteration of the process This is, uh, so it's, this is interesting to, this, this again, just like a conceptual exercise of thinking about the visual analytics process. 
in terms of this idea of overview first, zoom and filter details on demand. This is the what is usually known as the classic visualization mantra from Ben Schneiderman. He wrote this in 1996. Um, this is this has been this is really like a very very let's say ubiquitous thing it's everywhere in visualization right you you see it mentioned in uh, everywhere this idea of overview for first so you start with an overview of the data and this is where uh the the this thing i was discussing with daniel uh comes in because you start from this overview but with visualization itself without visual analytics there's this idea that this overview actually shows the entire data. And then you have the option to zoom and filter. And after you zoom and filter, you get details on demand. So you get details of these zoomed in filtered areas of your data set. However, with massive data sets, it is very difficult to create this overview in the first place because of what Daniel was saying, like there's just too much stuff on the screen at the same time. We're, we're, we're starting from the, the very definition that the data is too large and too complex. So it's not that we are saying, oh, maybe you can do this. No, no. If you can't do this, then it's, it's not in the scope of what we're discussing. We're, we're just starting. By definition, it is not possible. So zooming and filtering are effectively redundant, let's say, as the users are given little information about to examine first. So you see a lot of things and you say, okay, now I can zoom and filter, but I have no idea where I should zoom and filter because it's so complicated. The visualization is so busy, so cluttered that I simply have no idea where, where to go from here. And that's why for visual analytics, uh, there was this slight change on this mantra. So you could say that this is the visual analytics mantra, which is a little, slightly more complex. And in this visual analytics mantra, you start from analyze first. So the idea is that somehow you analyze first and then you show the important things. So for VA, the mantra is extended to show that it's not sufficient, sufficient to just display the data. You need, you need to analyze it because even before you start doing something, you should already have um, this, this step of knowing the important things that can be had from, from the data in general. So, so in, in a way, it's kind of biased towards starting with the data analysis and then going through the, to the visualization, I guess, I would say. And then from that, you can zoom, filter. And then after you do this zoom filtering, you just analyze further. So probably this same algorithm that you've used to show the important before you zoomed could also be run again after you zoomed. Sometimes, sometimes not, but usually, usually that's the idea, right? The idea usually is that you're you're steering this this analysis process. So so if you zoom or if you in filter, because you're basically telling the algorithm, look, I'm more interested in this thing than in that thing. So analyze again, but focusing more on this thing here, and and then you details on demand. Then after you you do this this let's say this drilling down then you can do this the details on the map and then then you can do the for example let's say if you're analyzing text then after you've you've gone all the way down to the to the actual text so to speak and then you can you can do the details on the map so it's interesting to to think a little bit about this that you have you, with visualization with visual analytics you go from this original mantra into a more uh, intertwined mantra between visualization and data analysis. And finally, uh, very quickly, I'm going to go through some ideas about what kind of infrastructure uh, a visual analytics tool should have. And I don't have much time, but I will try to be to be very, um, very quick. <laughs> Uh, the, so we, we've discussed about this this idea that visual analytics basically involves a lot of different areas at the same time, right? And all these different areas, especially these different computer science domains, they all have their own kind of, uh, let's say, uh, infrastructure. So a library, a database, 
not necessarily talks to a machine learning library directly because they were developed separately and they were the, the, the their development process never stopped to really like consider that you know what maybe these two things should interact with each other well sometimes they do but most of the time they don't so one of the most difficult issues that you are going to to find when you actually start building this this visual analytics tools is that every every component of your system the machine learning part the visualization part the database part they will basically be different things and and you're going to have to make them talk to each other and that's that's a real challenge actually uh, and one of the reasons why it is, it is real, uh, it's, uh, let's say, challenging is because visual analytics is both user-driven and data-driven. User-driven means that the user kind of is specifying things as it goes, while data-driven is when something is, is based on the availability of the data and the aspects and characteristics of the data so neither of them are dominate let's say very clearly over the other because the data dictates some requirements so you cannot do you run any algorithm on any data set depending on the type of the data or the structure of the data there are some algorithms and some analysis that you can run on that but at the same time the user also has requirements so it's not just because you can run a certain algorithm on a certain type of data that you necessarily want to run it so, so the user drives this. So the user has the requirements, the data has the requirements, and these two requirements, they must happen together during the workflow of the system. And that is very complicated. And some aspects that you will see that are complicated are, of course, the visualization architecture or the data structure. So this is just another representation of that uh, pipeline that we saw before. This is from another book. And this model, uh, so this model represents the visualization thing part very nicely, but it fails to describe the analytical process, right? So it's, uh, there are important aspects that are not really, um, let's say, considered here too much, which, which are, for example, blending different kinds of visualizations at the same time, right? So that's very much like a visual analytics thing. And, and and embedding the interaction within the visualization so so you're not we're not talking about anymore about having widgets on the visual uh, too much in order to to control the visualization it's more like actually interacting with the visualization that's also very complicated and maybe not super super well represented in this specific pipeline Data management is simply like databases. So every vision analytics application starts with data, as we saw in the, in the reference model. This data is either statically collected, so it's either there, period, or it's dynamically produced, so it's coming in as the system is running, the data is coming. Sometimes and that adds a lot of more complexity. And, and I mean, you know, these are just some examples of how Visual analytics tools usually handle data management, flat files, structured file formats, and so on. I mean, there's there's nothing there's not much here that we can do about this because it's just data basement data bases management. So so just just an idea to to remember that uh, this is also part of visual analytics. You need some kind of a database, and it's important to understand and to to choose the best one. Uh, analytical systems, this is very interesting. This part is very interesting. Analytical systems or just like data mining frameworks, they usually have a very simple model, right? The components basically read some input and write some output. So you, you give it a data set, you parameterize it somehow, like I want, like for example, the DB scan that we were looking at this morning. So you, you give it a data set, then you give it two parameters like the epsilon and the minimum of points, and then it does something and spits out some output. Most of data analysis frameworks are like that. Input, output, some param parameters to change that. However, when it actually comes to visual analytics, that is a problem because one of the things about visual analytics is that, first of all, you, 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 have, to have, you have to have transparency about what's happening inside the algorithm, and that's not the case with the black box. 
and also maybe you just don't want to wait one hour before you see the results. You want to see the results as they are coming in, right? So somehow, um, most visual analytic systems, or ideally, will show the development of the algorithm as it goes. It, it was not the case in the past, but nowadays it's becoming more and more common. So I would say that for you guys, if you have this in your system, that will be amazing. So, so not, let's say opening this black box of these systems so that you don't, you don't just wait for the results, but you see the results as they are being formed. Even better if you can interfere with that, but that's not uh, very common. So these are examples of things that, that should be present in, in that situation. So fast initial response. So you, you see a fast, like rough result, even though it's not the best one. Then uh, you recompute it following small changes. So if I change a little bit a parameter, I should be very quickly recomputing that, the, that uh, algorithm and steering the computation also. So as it, as it is going, like let's say you're, as the gradient descent, for example, is happening, um, sometimes it's interesting to have the ability to actually influence that somehow and change this, what's happening somehow, even though that's a very complicated thing to do. But you can see that these are, these are like not black box things. They have to open the black box in order to do that. And that's very complicated, but nowadays it's very interesting. Uh, and of course, uh, there's this, this thing about dissemination coming. This is my last slide, by the way. So there's this, this idea of how to communicate the insights that you have gathered from the visual analytics system. Because, you know, it's one thing to, to, to have your system running, to do everything that you have to do with it. You arrive at a certain solution. You arrive at a certain result that you're happy with. And then after all this process of, uh, after all this loop between man machine, you take this result and you give it to someone else like, okay, hey, you know what, this is your result, take it. So you see how you, if you do this, you throw away everything that was good about the, this, this analytical process that you have built together with the computer. So it's very important for visual analytics tools to, to save the information about how the process between you and the machine went, how did it happen, so that you can later communicate that. So the results of the visual analytics are not just how to show the results of what you, of what you came to, where you came to, but also the whole process that took you there. And this was, a, this was very interest, very nicely, exemplified by the Scatminder system designed by the Swedish guy, Hans Rosling, where he goes through the animation of the thing uh, and, and, they, and he tells a story about it, right? It's not just about, he could just come and say, you know what, this is a scatter plot. These are the countries that developed better. These are the countries that developed not so good. And, and that's it, let's say, in a simplified way. But instead of that, he comes from he, he goes through time to show how you can come up to that conclusion yourself by watching this animation of the data, for example. Of course, this is not visual analytics per se because you're not interacting with the system. You could. There are interactive uh, versions of Gapminder uh, that you can actually interact with the system, change parameters, and so on and so forth. But in the videos themselves, of course, it's just a video, right? So Hans Rosling is kind of like walking you through the process of understanding what's happening. And uh, that's, that, that was, that's a very compelling example of, of telling stories with data, right? And so, so basically, finally, to conclude, uh, vision analytic systems ideally should be designed to save the analysis process in such a way that you can actually communicate that entire process at the end and not just the actual visualization that was resulting from, okay? And this is my last slide for the Vision Analytics course uh, lecture. And I hope you guys have enjoyed it. We are now at uh, 1501, so I, was, I am one minute um, 
late. This, the next, next week we don't have lectures scheduled, so it's just presentation. And we have defined that we will try to do everything on Wednesday. If some of you or any of you needs or wants to do it on Thursday, please get back to me and Konstantin, and then we can schedule on Thursday, I guess. But I guess if we also just do it on, on everything on Wednesday, it's easy, easier for everyone. And it's very important that you guys watch each other's presentation. So, so basically that's it. The next lecture then is in two weeks and I will come back to visual analytics, but then uh, we're gonna discuss some actual examples of visual analytics tools and, and some other stuff that I will uh, get back to you later about. But it's gonna be like visual analytics too in two weeks, all right? And I guess that's it guys. If you don't have any questions, I will let you go. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Bye-bye. Good afternoon.